Today I will talk about this, uh, this topic, this discretizable distance geometry problems, um, which constitute a particular class of distance geometry problems uh, whose search space can be discretized and represented by a binary tree. And then I will discuss some uh, symmetry properties that uh, occurs in this uh, discretized discrete search space. This is a joint work with many people. Uh, here is a non-exhaustive list, uh, Michael Souza from Universidade Federal de Ceará, Luiz Mariano Carvalho from uh, UFRJ in Rio, Carlili Lavoro from Unicamp, Leo Liberti from Ecole Polytechnique, who gave a talk on Tuesday, and uh, also Antonio Mucarino. And so uh, my talk uh, is divided in two parts. So in the first part, I will, focus, I will focus on the symmetry properties of discretizable distance geometry problems. And on the second part, I'd like to discuss about stationary points of the smooth stress function for this class of distance geometry problems. So uh, first of all, as we, you have already seen this uh, mini symposium, the workshop, uh, we will formalize the discretizable distance geometry problem uh, using the, the, the notation of graphs. So given a simple undirected graph, G, with a set of vertices and edges, uh, weighted by a function D, which uh, associates positive weights to the edges of this graph. And we have an edge in this graph if the distance between two vertices is known. And an integer k, which is positive, which represents the target dimension, we would like to find uh, what we call a realization. So a map from the set of vertices to Euclidean space of dimension k, such that the realized distances, the Euclidean distances, coincide, match with the given distances. So um, this problem is known to be uh, NP, NP hard. It uh, was proved by Sachs. For any dimension k, in particular for dimension k equal to one, it is an EP complete. And uh, Leo Liberti gave an explanation in, the, in his talk on, on Tuesday. You can show that by polynomial reduction from partition or subset sum. But uh, there are uh, special classes of this uh, distance geometry problem for which you can obtain uh, polynomial time algorithms. For instance, if you have all the distance, which means that your graph is complete, then you can obtain the realization by uh, performing the spectral decomposition of the gram matrices, a uh, gram matrix associated to the, the distance matrix when you have all the distances. But even if you don't have a complete graph, you still have some classes of this problem for which you can solve the, the problem polynomial time. Uh, one of these classes is uh, what we call uh, decision problems, where the underlying graph G is a K-letary graph. What does it mean? It means that the, the vertices are, you can find a, an order for the vertices of this graph, such that the first K plus one vertices form a clique, and for all other vertices uh, anchored after vertex K plus one, there are at least k plus one adjacent predecessors. So here on the right, I give an example for the dimension k equal to two. So uh, this graph, you can consider here the vertices one, two, three, forming a clique. And then you see that for all vertices, four, five, six, seven, there are at least uh, uh, three adjacent predecessors. And uh, why is this property good? Well, this property is good because it allow us, allows us to perform k alteration, which means the following. If you are working, for instance, in dimension k equal to three, okay? And we would like to, to find a position for the vertex k. And we know it is adjacent to vertices one, two, three, and four, okay? then the position for the vertex xk can be obtained by solving the system of quadratic equations. Actually, I can put this square here and there, okay? And uh, it turns out that this uh, system can be reduced to a linear system uh, for which the matrix A is non-singular, as long as the points x1, x2, x3, and x4, which are positions for uh, already localized vertices, one, two, three, and four, 
uh, as long as they are affine independent. In this case, in dimension three, the four points uh, do not lie on the same plane. Okay. In this case, uh, you can compute all the vertex positions in linear time. And this is a work from uh, Vu, from Dong and Vu. Okay. Of course, here uh, we are considering exact distance. All right. Another class of graphs for which um, we can do some things in this direction is what we call the k minus one alternative graphs. In this case, we uh, weaken the assumptions a little bit. Instead of asking for k plus one adjacent predecessors, we ask only for k. But then, instead of performing uh, the intersection of k plus one spheres in our k, which in general gives you uh, only one position, we are now performing the intersection of k uh, hyperspheres in our k, which under sweet ball assumptions can give you at most two solutions. Okay, so uh, the possibilities are the intersection of these k spheres uh, could be empty, uh, one point, two points, or infinite points. But if we suppose that the, the instance at hand is a yes instance, which means it has a solution, then we rule out this option. And uh, if, uh, as, as long as the, the vertices, the predecessors, okay, x, y minus one, y minus one, y minus three, uh, are not collinear, then uh, we also rule out this uh, last option and we end up with one or two solutions. Okay, so I will focus in this talk about this kind of distance geometry problems, okay, uh, for which the underlying graph is a k minus one alternative graph. In this case, of course, uh, you are imagining, okay, but if I have two points, which one should I choose? And we'll see that actually uh, in the sequential approach that we consider, which is called the branch and prune, we actually consider both, okay. And uh, this uh, leads to a binary tree of possible positions. So uh, based on these ideas of K minus one lateration, I define now what, I what we call discretizable distance geometry problem. So we say that the distance geometry problem is discretizable if there exists a vertex order such that the first vertices in this order uh, form a clique, as I said before, and we have uh, uh, the following. For each vertex um, from index k plus one to index n or cardinality of v, uh, the vertex vi must have at least k adjacent predecessors. So this uh, ugly expression here just means that vi must have at least k adjacent predecessors. And moreover, the position for these k adjacent predecessors uh, sh should have a finite dimension k minus one. So if we are working in the plane, for instance, um, it means that the two points cannot be uh, at the same position if we are in our tree. So the three points cannot be uh, collinear and so on. Okay. Um, it's important to know, notice that in this uh, definition, uh, we involve only uh, a subset of the edges in the graph, or uh, you consider a subset of your distance constraints that we're gonna call uh, discretization edges, are the edges involved in this assumption, and we will represent them by ED, and we have the, all the others that we may or may not have, we call the pruning edges. And uh, in fact, I will consider uh, a subclass of the DDGP, which we call the DNDGP, where we change the, the second assumption and we ask the adjacent predecessors to be contiguous. We ask to um, immediate adjacent predecessors. So for each vertex VI with I greater than K, uh, it must be connected, it, it must, must be adjacent, adjacent to the vertex i minus one, i minus two, i minus k. And if you have this condition, we can rewrite the, the second condition where we ask the positions for these vertices uh, to, 
to, to lie in an affine space of dimension k minus one, we can re rewrite this condition using the kelly menger determinant, asking the kelly menger determinant to be non-zero. And uh, well, so this N here stands for the molecular because this uh, class of distance geometry problems appears uh, often in the context of uh, protein structure determination. And so we, we include this M to uh, stress the fact that the adjacent predecessors must be contiguous, okay? In this definition, it implies what? In terms of the topology of the graph, it implies that the, the graph is a chain of K plus one clicks, like this one I showed here, okay? Uh, of course, one may ask, okay, but uh, how hard is to determine if uh, such vertex order exists? And this talk will be discussed in the next talk by Merv. Okay, so I will leave with her the, the discussion about uh, how to compute the vertex orders. From now on, we will discuss about this class of problems, the DMDGPs. So for the DMDGPs, um, we can exploit the search space, which uh, is represented by a binary tree, use an algorithm called branch and prune, here I, I show up pseudocode for this algorithm, which uh, uh, is showed here in its recursive form. Okay, so uh, the algorithm calls itself recursively, um, given, uh, given the initial positions for the first K vertices, for all other vertices, what we do is the following. We, the assumptions ensure that we have at least K adjacent predecessors, so we perform an intersection of K spheres in RK by solving this quadratic system, okay? And this uh, uh, generates two possible candidate positions, okay? I call it here Xi plus Xi minus. And then we check the feasibility of each position. If it's feasible, then we continue. We call the branch and prune in the next vertex, okay? Uh, otherwise we go to the, to the other candidate and try again. And here by feasible, we mean the following. We mean that um, all adjacent, uh, all edges, okay, related to adjacent vertices, to neighbors of VI that were not used in this quadratic system, they are verified. And we say that the XI is feasible if the, the constraint related to the distance GHI is satisfied with a toler within a tolerance epsilon, okay? Uh, actually, this uh, feasibility test, you could include other uh, criteria, okay? And uh, for instance, uh, yesterday, uh, Jenshin mentioned uh, some properties like the, the, the Van der Waals constraints and so on. And so if you are working with uh, uh, molecules, if you are working with the protein structure determination, you could include some other pruning devices here. Uh, for instance, using uh, information about the Van der Waal forces or also uh, chirality and so on. If you are working, for instance, with sensor networks, then you could exploit the radio range to include their other feasibility tests, okay? And here is an example of uh, how this binary tree is built, okay? Actually, the binary tree is an abstraction, okay, just to represent the possible choices that we have uh, for each vertex position. But in particular, when the dimension is k equal to two, I can draw in the same figure, the binary tree and also the candidate vertex positions. So that's what we're gonna do. So suppose here you, you have uh, your first vertex x1 that you could uh, place at the origin of the plane, for instance, and then it's uh, the vertex X2 or uh, yes, the distance between one and two uh, is given by this line segment, then X2 would be here. And okay, this is our initial K click. Okay. And then for all the other vertices, the DMGP assumptions ensure that for instance, for vertex three, we know the distance from the, the third vertex to the, to the first and the second. And then we can perform the sphere intersections. So here I'm representing part of these spheres, okay, centered at uh, uh, one and two and the respective ready. And then we have these two possible positions, okay, we consider both. 
And then we make a choice, we go to the left or to the right, suppose we go to the left. Then for the fourth position, the assumptions ensure that we have distance from the fourth vertex to uh, the vertices three and two. And then we again perform uh, an sphere intersection. And this leads to another two positions now for vertex four. Okay, and we keep growing the, the tree in this way. However, eventually you may have more than two, uh, in this case, more than K adjacent predecessors. And this additional uh, information can be used to prune infeasible uh, candidate positions. So here are two positions for the vertex four. But for instance, if you have uh, a distance from vertex one to vertex four, that passes, okay, that uh, is matched only by this vertex, then we prune this other candidate position and consider this one, okay? Here it's important to mention that uh, uh, I only showed in this, in this example, in this example, I have uh, four vertices, but this tree could keep growing here. Of course, when you prune as, uh, at a certain point, you do not consider the, the subtree, which is hooted on this uh, vertex position, okay? And uh, if you, you prune a certain uh, candidate position, you backtrack in the tree and continue in this way. And so uh, we backtrack and go to the other side of the tree and we find another solution here. In this case, we already see the first uh, symmetry which appears in this uh, discrete search space, okay? Uh, the, there are two realizations here which are compatible with the distance in this example, which, uh, which are this one on the left going from the, the, the root to the blue leaf and the other one here. And there are reflections of each other over uh, through this hyperplane passing by X1 and X2, okay? And it turns out that this binary tree or this discrete search space not only have a symmetry here, but also uh, in many other places in this, uh, in this tree, okay? And that's what we will discuss in this talk. And how to exploit the symmetries in order to obtain um, a more efficient algorithm for solving uh, DMGPs. So in order to talk about this uh, symmetry properties of the DMGP, we need some definitions, okay? So uh, first, I would denote by X hat, the set of uh, all incongruent realizations that satisfy the distance constraints related to discretization edges. Remember the discretization edges are the edges um, which, which are implied by the definition of DMGP. Are the, are the edges or the corresponding distances which are used to perform the sphere intersections to determine the candidate positions. So in this case, for the, the previous example, uh, we have four incongruent realizations. X hat would be this realization on the left, uh, this other realization on the left and the two others on the right. And uh, it's not hard to, to show that the number of these uh, we call possible realizations or candidate realizations, okay? It's not hard to see that the cardinality of X hat is two to the power cardinality of V minus the dimension, okay? And among the, the candidate realizations, okay? Uh, a few, uh, maybe few of them or all of them, it depends on the, the distance constraints that we have. Um, we have a subset of X hat which is the set of valid realizations. I mean, the set of solutions for the DMGP problem. And so here uh, in this example, we have this realization on the left and also this realization here on the right. Okay, and as I said before, they are uh, reflections of each other through the hyperplane passing uh, by the X1 and X2, the first initial positions. So we also need the, the, the concept of partial reflections. So in order to define the partial reflections, we will consider candidate realizations at X hat, okay? And for every vertex uh, which uh, with index I greater than K, we will define this operator, which is uh, a reflector actually uh, applied to Y. It is the reflection of Y uh, uh, through the hyperplane 
defined by the positions uh, x i minus one, x i minus two, x i minus k. Okay, uh, is the reflection of y through the hyperplane defined by these points? And these points, it's important to know so that, they, that they depend on the realization you are considering. Okay, so uh, with these uh, reflector operators, we can define what we call the partial reflections. Okay, which are operators acting on the the candidate realizations or candidate positions. Okay, and then when we apply uh, a partial reflection operator to a certain uh, candidate uh, realization X, what we do is to ap apply these reflections from vertex X i to vertex X n. Okay, so this is illustrated in this figure. So we have here the first realization X1, X2, X3, A, X4, A, all right? And then a second realization would be uh, obtained by reflecting X, A4 by this hyperplane passing, uh, passing through these two vertices. And then we would obtain X, uh, X4, B. This I call it the realization uh, X prime. All right, uh, here's X, here X prime, here X two prime, and here X uh, three prime. And we see that uh, all uh, possible realizations, they are in fact obtained by compositions of partial reflections applied to the first realization at the left. So here we can see that the X prime is uh, the partial reflection applied to the realization X, which means that we're gonna reflect this vertex and maintain all the others, then we obtain X prime. Uh, X two prime is the reflection of X prime uh, through the first hyperplane. So if you reflect this realization through this hyperplane, we obtain X uh, two prime. And uh, the X three prime is obtained then by the reflection of X two prime through this other hyperplane, right? And so useful facts, use, useful properties about the partial reflections uh, are that, uh, okay, the part, uh, if, you, if you perform a reflection of Y through the hyperplane, uh, defined by the vertex positions x i minus one to x i minus k, then it's obvious that the distance from y to any point in this hyperplane is going to be the same. Also, all pairwise distance between the, the positions x i minus k to x n, they are preserved when we apply the partial reflection, because uh, indeed you, it's like you have a, a rigid transformation, but only acting. Uh, from this point onwards. So all the distances here are preserved. Uh, if, you, if you consider an entire realization, so if you here we are starting at uh, i minus k, but if you consider x1 until x i minus k minus one, okay? When you apply a partial reflection, the only distance that may change, that change uh, are those related, uh, are those involving vertices uh, with indices from one to i minus k minus one and verts and ending uh, at vertices i until n, okay? All others are preserved. And so this implies that the partial reflections, they preserve the distance related to discretization adds. In other words, it means that if X is a candidate realization, then its partial reflection is also a, can a candidate realization. And, uh, Moreover, all realizations in the set X hat can be generated by a single one performing a composition of partial reflections. And that's what I showed in the previous example. Uh, another very useful property related to these partial reflections is the following. Um, under suitable assumptions, we can show that uh, applying the, uh, the reflection of, uh, of Y through the eth hyperplane of uh, realization X, follow it by a reflection uh, through the k hyperplane of the realization GIX is the same as first reflecting Y through the k hyperplane of realization X and then reflecting 
the result uh, through the hyper to the it hyperplane of helization X. And this uh, identity is very important because it shows the following. If you compose two partial reflections, okay, you will see that uh, some, of, some of the reflectors will depend on the helization X and some of the reflectors will depend on the helization X prime, which I call it the uh, GK of X, okay? And then you think, oh, okay, so in order to perform or to obtain this result, uh, it is, um, we have to backtrack on the tree and obtain the other realization. But then thanks to this identity, you can show that this composition, in fact, it depends only on the realization X. Okay, it's the, the last uh, equality that we have here. And this is uh, illustrated by this example. Here, if you consider all the possible positions for vertex four that I represent here by A, B, C, and D, Okay, you see that, okay, B is the reflection of A through this hyperplane. C uh, could be the reflection of B through this hyperplane, but also you could reflect, uh, uh, okay, first A through this hyperplane and then the result to this hyperplane and the same for D. So in the end of the day, uh, all of positions for the fourth vertex depends only on the first realization and this is really important to speed up the, the computations. It's really important in the implementation, as I will discuss later. And uh, okay, here I just simplified and showed that if you have the realization uh, on the left, and uh, with this realization, you can compute these two uh, symmetry hyperplanes. And using this information, you can generate all the, the possible positions for the, the vertex number four without uh, needing to construct or to build the, the, the position of the intermediate vertices in the other uh, candidate realizations. And this is a very nice work. So um, a very useful result, okay, that uh, has been proved by, was proved by Libert and the others in 2014, asserts that uh, if you have, um, if you have, um, let me let me think here. Uh, J minus k, J minus i greater than k, and this uh, actually has to do with edges i j, okay. And uh, without laws of general generality, let's suppose that j is greater than i. And so, if you impose this condition, we are saying that this edge is a pruning edge. And what this theorem says is the following. If you consider J, J and I uh, arbitrary, uh, satisfying this constraint, this uh, condition, then in the binary tree of a DMDGP, okay, uh, the, this distance, I mean, the Euclidean distance between XI and XJ among all the possible realizations in this tree, it will generate a set of two to the power j minus i minus k real positive values. What does it mean, for instance, if you have the distance from vertex one to vertex four, okay, if you consider this distance, or if you consider the indices i equal to one j equal to four, it says that, okay, for the fourth uh, vertex, you have, uh, okay, you replace here four minus one minus uh, two, you you you're gonna have two, uh, distance values that will be generated by the vertex positions of vertex four. And this is not the only true uh, for this example that I said, uh, for instance, from distance one and four. It's also valid in the subtrees that may appear here. Okay, and so this is a nice property. And uh, moreover, uh, this theorem says that if um, you have a realization, you have two realizations, two possible realizations, which agree with each other until vertex i plus k minus one, okay? Then the distance, the realized distance, okay? Uh, norm of x i minus x j, norm of x i minus x j prime, they are gonna be equal if and only if x j prime is the reflection of x j, through the uh, I plus K hyperplane. What does it mean? It means that 
Okay, if I have a helization here for which the distance from one to four is this in dark blue, then we're gonna have uh, another one with the same value of this distance, if and only if it's the reflection of this position through this hyperplane, which is this one. And uh, similarly, we, we have this for the second distance, okay? And this is a very nice theorem, uh, with, uh, which allows to prove uh, some nice properties concerning the number of solutions of a DMGP instance. And so, uh, in order to, to tell the result about the, the cardinality of the solution set, let me introduce another, um, another set, which is the set of symmetry vertices, the set S. This set of symmetry vertices, it, um, it basically says that uh, are the vertices of uh, your graph for which the, uh, there is no pruning edge, okay? There is no pruning edge starting before L minus K and uh, uh, arriving at um, after L. So this set is, uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? It's okay? Yes, sir. yes so, we can hear you. Okay, okay. So uh, this set, which is called symmetry vertex set, is really important because uh, it reveals which vertices or which hyperplanes, um, um, through which hyperplanes we can perform uh, partial reflections and still remain in the solution set. So uh, if you have X in the, in the set of solutions of the DMGP instance and VI is a symmetry vertex, it means it belongs to this set, then if you apply a partial reflection in uh, a partial reflection to X, this guy remains on the solution set. And then thanks to this lemma, it has been proven that uh, with probability one, the number of solutions of a uh, yes DMGP instance is two to the power cardinality of S and S is the solution set. Uh, a straightforward corollary is the following. If you have the pruning edge from the first to the last vertex, okay, then this set S uh, is gonna be only the vertex K plus one, the cardinality is gonna be one. And so you have only two solutions. So uh, as I showed before in this example, for instance, if we uh, do have the distance from vertex one to vertex four, it must be one of these two because the instance is yes. And then what uh, uh, we have is that this problem, for instance, if the, the distance is this light blue, then the problem has only two solutions. And this will be exploited in, the, in a new algorithm that I will talk to you in the next few slides. So, uh, okay, if you consider this uh, theory of partial reflections, you see that the problem, the, the, the discretizable molecular decision problem, it boils down to find the correct composition of partial reflections. Because if, if you compute a possible realization X hat, and this can be done by taking any path from the root to the leaf, to the leaf node in a tree. For instance, we, we could start with the leftmost uh, realization in this example, okay? So given uh, a candidate realization X in X hat, uh, we have to choose the correct composition of partial reflections. So here I, I just uh, created this uh, operator, okay, uh, which is nothing but a composition of partial reflections, but with exponents here, which are binary variables. So if this variable is one, you apply the partial reflection. If the, uh, the component this um, variable is zero, you do not apply the, the, the partial reflection. And so um, all the game resumes to you want to find a binary vector S such that all distance constraints are satisfied, okay? And uh, 
With this formulation, we can also state uh, a similar result uh, as in the previous slide. If I give you a valid realization, I mean a solution of the DMGP problem, okay, then in order to obtain all other solutions, you can just vary this binary vector S in this set. And what this set says is the following. Okay, you are allowed to change the binary variables uh, SL only if the vertex K plus L is a symmetry vertex, All right? So of course, first we need to uh, determine a solution, but then if you have a solution, you can generate all others by flipping these uh, binary values, okay, that are allowed to change. And so uh, we came up recently, uh, not recently, we started discussion, I think uh, last year, one year and a half ago. And then we realized the following, okay, so, in fact, uh, we can tackle the discretizable molecular integer problem by solving a sequence of subproblems in the following way. First, we start with a possible realization, okay? And then we define an arbitrary order for the pruning edges. And we will consider one pruning edge at a time, okay? So first we solve, so let me just write down the, the idea here. First, we solve these equations, <clears throat> sorry, for uh, i and j in the set of discretization edges, okay? And then we add one new constraint at a time. And so after solving this problem, let's call problem one, I don't know. And then we include a new uh, constraint, for instance, I don't know, x w x ten squared d u w, and solve this new problem. And uh, how we do that? We do that by uh, searching among the solutions of the previous problem, those for which this distance constraint is satisfied. And in order to perform the search, we take advantage of the, the partial reflections that I told you before. So basically given, um, uh, given a certain pruning edge, we define the set of, um, of preceding pruning edges. I mean pruning edges that were considered before the, the edge ij, okay? And then we are able to show the following. Uh, First, if you, if you solve, a, suppose you have a, a sequence of pruning edges, okay, write down uh, here on the top. So maybe you have here, I don't know, uh, KL, and then you have UW, and then you finally arrive at IJ, okay? And so we showed that if you have a solution for the distance geometry problem, cons consider, uh, consider pruning edges up to here, okay? Then the solution set of the distance geometry problem, including this edge, will be a subset of the, the, the previous solution set. And that's what this remark says, okay? And so, as I said before, basically what we are doing is among the solutions of the previous subproblem, look for those who satisfy the new pruning edge. And so basically we are solving a system of, uh, uh, of uh, equations, nonlinear equations, okay, by uh, solving one new equation at a time. And every time we solve this new equation, we make sure that we do not violate the previous ones. And so basically, uh, this is the algorithm. And in order to uh, formalize the algorithm and prove its correctness, we need, uh, we need to define what we call the symmetry vertices for the subproblems or the necessary symmetry vertices. So the definition is uh, very similar to the set S, but now we define it for the subproblem IJ. So it's the set of vertices in the subproblem IJ, uh, varying the index L in this range, for which there is no previous pruning edge 
starting before L minus K and ending uh, after W. So this set will review uh, which partial reflections we are allowed to perform in order to keep uh, in order to keep the, the, the solution feasible with respect to the previous problem. It's what the lemma tree says. So uh, suppose you, you are handling uh, the constraint ij and you already solved the problem with the constraint uw and uh, xs is a valid realization for the problem guw. Then uh, for every uh, binary vector s prime in the set bij, okay, which is defined here, uh, we, you have that X of uh, S prime, it's still in the solution set of the problem GUW. And so we are, uh, we know how to modify the solutions, the previous solution, okay, uh, and continue in the, in the solution set of the previous problem in order to search for the solution for the new edge that we included. And it's possible to show that this vector S prime is unique. So uh, gathering all these ideas, we present the symmetry-based build-up uh, algorithm, which basically uh, says the following. Give a, a candidate realization, OK, x in x hat, and a certain order for the pruning edges you follow this order and you uh, conquer or you satisfy one new distance constraint at a time in the following way. If that set of the symmetry vertex for the subproblem uh, is no empty, then you find S prime in the set Bij that I defined in the previous slide, such that this new distance is satisfied. And it's important to notice that here in order to obtain this uh, S prime, what we do is to perform the partial reflections, but only those that are allowed. I mean, only those that are implied by the set Bij. And this we do uh, in a performing an exhaustive search. Okay, but this is exhaustive search. Indeed, uh, we took care to use the idea that I presented to you a few slides ago, where you said that uh, in order to compute the, the positions for the, the vertex J, we don't need to compute all the candidate realizations, but we can actually compute only the positions for XJ, okay, all the positions for XJ, and select one of them which satisfies this constraint. And this, uh, it's nice because you don't need to backtrack in the binary tree in order to build another candidate realization. And on, only when uh, we find the correct position for XJ, then we apply the partial reflections for all other divergences. And then we update and continue. So uh, we're able to show that the algorithm uh, is correct First, by showing that if the set of the symmetry vertex, vertices for the problem ij is empty, then, um, then the current solution, xs, is already a solution for the problem gij. It means that you don't need to change anything because the current realization already satisfies the distance uh, dij. Okay? And then we prove a theorem showing that, okay, with exact arithmetic, Algorithm two finds a realization uh, X in the solution set of the DMGP problem. Okay, the time run out fast. Uh, let me go to, to the numerical experiment, experiments very fast. And uh, so we tested on some artificial instances uh, based on proteins. So we basically download a protein from PDB and we consider only the distance between the atoms in the backbone and it's uh, carbon alpha carbon. And uh, the distances are included if the, if the atoms are separated by at most three covalent bonds. We know th that this is an artificial uh, assumption in the sense that some of this distance may not be available in practice, but it was only for test purposes. Uh, the way we generated the, the the instances, these protein-like instances, okay, 
The natural backbone order is already a vertex order for, uh, for our problem. I mean, the natural order is uh, already satisfies the DMGP assumptions. And so we could apply the branch and prune or this new algorithm called the SPBU. And we compare the, the quality of the solutions by using the mean distance error. Uh, okay, there are some details that uh, we skip. Uh, we have here um, we have here the the repo where you can find our data sets and the codes. And I also provide here the Antonio's GitHub where you can find the code for the branch and prune. And we compare it in two sets uh, of proteins. Okay, with cutoff distance of six angstroms. And so here you can see the number of atoms, the number of edges. I mean, almost concluding Antonio. Uh, the number of sets, the number of edges, the density of the graph. Okay, uh, here the cardinality of the set S. And uh, you have the classic branch imprint and the new algorithm. Here you have the time in seconds. So both are really, really fast. And the MDE uh, is uh, okay, very reasonable of order 10 to the minus 11, minus 12. Uh, and we see that they speed up with the new algorithm with respect to BP is non-trivial. Okay, we, we see that uh, for some instances, we have like hundreds of times faster than branch and prune. And the situation is also similar for sparser graphs. Okay, and in this case, in this particular case, we have one instance for which the branch and prune could not find a solution in less than 300 seconds, which is this last one, and for which we could find a solution. And here are the speed up, the ratio between the time of SPBU and SPP. So um, in the second part of the talk, I would like to discuss the stationary points of distress for the MGPs, but I think I run out of the time, okay? I will only mention uh, one last example. So let me just uh, uh, tell, talk, tell about the problem. So the problem is the following, the, the, the decision problem can be formulated as a, a, a optimization problem, a nonlinear least square problem given by this function. In the literature of multidimensional scaling, this function is known as the smooth stress. And there is an open question uh, about the existence or not of uh, local non-global minimizers of this function. Okay, uh, but this is just a preliminary study from my side, so I will not go into details. I would just say that, so the question, is there any non-global minimizer? I'm not aware of uh, um, any author who was able to uh, analytically prove the existence of a non-global minimizer for the smooth stress, not the stress, the smooth stress function, okay? And I just like to say that, uh, okay, for the DMEDGP, uh, we may have an example of uh, local minimizer, which is not global, that I give here in the last slide. Uh, okay, these numbers are uh, really large here because actually I, I numericize the result of my computations, my algebraic computations with this, the, the Mathematica. Okay, and uh, we managed to show that for this instance of the DMGP in dimension one, we do have a local minimizer or at least it seems so. But there is a trick here because we do not have all the distances available. Okay, we have four points, but only four distance instead of six. If we include the other six distance, then the, the local minimizer disappears. And so we still have this open question, which I hope someone here in the audience uh, can help me with, uh, I don't know, some reference. And so in conclusion, I'd like to say that the discretizable molecular decision problems, they have very interesting and remarkable symmetry properties, uh, which may be exploited to solve the problem more efficiently. In particular, these properties allow us to count the number of solutions of the problem without needing to solve the problem. Uh, they also uh, tell us that given one solution, I can generate all the others, okay, by using partial reflections. And exploiting the symmetry properties, we were able to, um, to present a new algorithm for this class of decision problems, which has um, um, a 
how can I say, a, a considerable or a non-trivial speed up with respect to the classic branch improvement. There are some open questions. The, the specific order in which the pruning edges should, uh, should be treated. Here, we treated them in, uh, let me remember, in increasing order of I and decreasing order of J. So we, if you imagine a distance matrix, we treat first the distance that are closer to the diagonal and later the ones that are farther from the diagonal. And uh, of course, a question, is it possible to extend these ideas to treat inexact distance? And we are still working on, on this topic. And concerning the existence of non-global minimizers of uh, smooth stress function, uh, I would say that it's still an open problem. And uh, we hope that we can find some special class of distance geometry problems for which we can uh, show uh, a local minimizer, which is not global, as we could do in the last example of DMGP, but in that case, we do not have all the distance. And uh, what are the connections of this question with rigid theory? So uh, here are some references that uh, you can see later in the video. And thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Douglas. <clears throat> so are there any questions? Uh, maybe we have some, some in the chat. Let me just yeah. There was see. a yeah. There was one left in the chat. Otherwise, we have uh, so um, Itam Itamar asked: Are are the reflections and partial reflections uh, inducing symmetries? Yes, Itamar, it's exactly that. Yeah, the symmetries are induced by this partial by the the hyperplanes actually, uh, but which are related to the the partial reflection. Another point is. How about reflect uh, projections? If I choose the right or suitable plane, hyperplane to reflect on, mm -hmm. I may induce also some hidden symmetries or realistic protein symmetries. Mm -hmm. And... Uh... So the question now is, you focused on reflections and partial reflections. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but the projections are also part of the toolkit, no? Yes, of course, of course. Indeed, uh, you, you, can, you can describe a reflection using projections, okay? But uh, for the DMEDGP, we only consider the partial reflections. It was the, I don't know, uh, the most natural uh, operation to consider, given the structure of our problem, but uh, we may consider this idea. Okay. Other okay. questions for the audience? <laughs> yes. Oh. What about the noise that, uh, Henry? Yeah. Uh, so we we still do not have a conclusive results uh, using noisy data. So to begin with, we we cannot show the same uh, properties I presented today if we consider the data are noisy. And perhaps the first question when we are dealing with these uh, symmetries is which uh, candidate configuration should we choose? So let me show the, uh, my, my repeated picture here. So let's suppose that this, uh, I don't know, the light blue distance is correct but now it is corrupted by noise, okay? So in this case, none of the, if you, if you consider epsilon zero uh, tolerance, none of the candidate realizations for the vertex four uh, will fulfill this, this distance, okay? And uh, then if we consider this uh, search in the tree, we would stop. But then one could say, okay, uh, so consider the right uh, uh, candidate realization, the one which minimizes the violation of this noise distance. Okay, but then in this case, we can maybe come up with a noisy distance for which all the four positions here will be accepted. And so we need to, to change the theorems and the structure of the algorithms and so on. What I can say Harry, uh, from our group, okay, including Leo, Carlili, Antonio, Michael, uh, we've done some uh, advances in this direction. Where is it? 
considering uh, interval distances. So in this paper, okay, of uh, Carlile, Leo, and Antonio, and this paper by myself, uh, in this one, they consider the inexactness modeled by an interval and then sample this interval. But then the, the search tree is no longer binary, but uh, k -ary, where k is the number of samples you, you choose. Okay, and the results are not that good. We could only uh, have uh, good results for small proteins. In this uh, paper, uh, I consider a sort of least square approach for the problem. So here, I consider the distance as it is with noise. And then uh, the difference with respect to the branch and prune is that here, uh, I use the Euclidean distance matrix approach to solve the subproblems in a least square sense. Okay, and I keep track of the eigenvalues of the partial realizations and I say, oops, we are in our tree. If the fourth eigenvalue is much, much larger than a certain threshold, something is wrong, I prune and backtrack. And here we could uh, get kind of nice results, but only for very small noise, Henry. Uh, I would say uh, at most one or 2% multiplicative noise, all right? Yeah, I guess the noise starts growing after. Exactly, yeah. Growing. And uh, it's a, a sequential method. And uh, it's, uh, I think that noise, it's even worse for uh, sequential methods, for build-up methods. <clears throat> 